Welcome to episode 106, When Client Therapist Values Clash, the diversity training every clinician needs right now, featuring Lambers Fisher, LMFT. For more information, please visit us at clearlyclinical.com. By Clearly Clinical, learn, grow, shine. Hello to our listeners. My name is Elizabeth Irias, and I am very honored and excited to be spending some time with Lambers Fisher. This episode has been proudly sponsored by Therapy Notes Electronic Health Record. Lambers is a licensed marriage and family therapist, a clinical supervisor, an adjunct uh, instructor, and national speaker on the topic of multicultural awareness and diversity. Lambers, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Thanks, Beth. Um, So we have a lot to talk about today and kind of Um, your shame-free perspective on how clinicians can increase their cultural humility, cultural competence. We'll talk about these different terms and what they mean. But I want to start by inviting you to speak about your background, about yourself, and how you came to have this specialization. Sure. Thanks. Uh, Like I said, I'm Lambert Fisher. I'm a marriage family therapist, first and foremost. I've been counseling in some degree for about 18 years now in various environments, whether it be uh, for-profit, non-profit, um, faith-based. And it's provided a nice opportunity to get a greater variety of clients than I could have planned for myself based on different age ranges, socioeconomic status, ethnicities, geographic regions, ur- urban, suburban, um, uh, some rural a little bit, depending on where uh, how far out we go. And that combination has allowed me to modify uh, my passion, not only um, from couples, uh, premarital couples, engaged couples, uh, struggling couples, um, to taking that desire to see relationships strengthened in one form or another, to recognizing that cross-cultural relationships need to be strengthened, especially now more so than having before. And so to find unique opportunities to take the same tools that help strengthen couple relationships within one's family to helping strengthen cross-cultural relationships, whether it be family, coworker, colleague, or just the community as a whole, uh, I found that they can not only be impactful as a professional, but also in their personal lives as well. And so that opportunity to take that to various different kinds of helping professionals around the country uh, and see them have light bulbs over their heads and says, wait, I can do that. And hopefully um, we can empower more people to do that. Thank you. Um, Thank you for talking about such a heavy topic um, and bringing so many years of experience to this. So why don't we just dive right in and start talking about to you what even the concept of cultural competence means? What does that look like through your eyes, not only as a clinician, but also as a black man? Indeed. Uh, Cultural competence to me is an intentional effort to not uh, chase terms. We use uh, different ways of describing things, whether it be cultural competence, cultural sensitivity, uh, cultural humility, although they all have unique uh, aspects to them. The goal is the same, to not let differences stop us from being able to see the other person, to value the other person, to see different needs. Sensitive often has this negative connotation of, of walking on eggshells, but that only describes someone's caution. And oftentimes that caution isn't necessarily negative. It's a sincere, genuine desire to not offend, to not do anything wrong because they recognize there's different needs that they want to meet, but don't know how to do it. But if we increase our competence and as competence, as opposed to cultural expertise, expertise almost has a a element of finality to it. Are you a cultural expert? Yes, I have arrived. I have, I got the certificate to prove it. No, there's always more things to learn about different people. So whatever word we decide to use, um, if it has that goal to acknowledge ourselves, increase our self-awareness, increase our other awareness, highlight the similarities and differences and be competent enough to use them both to enhance our helping efforts, then our clients will benefit from it. And then all of our efforts will be that much more uh, effective as a result. Got it. Thank you. So let's talk about cultural competence then. You do these trainings across the country. You work with professionals all the time on this particular topic. What barriers do you see in this community when it comes to professionals seeking more cultural diversity training? What holds people up? More often than not, what I see uh, from professionals seeking help is not just checking the box off for a continuing education requirement, but a genuine desire to understand more than they do because they haven't had as much diversity of cultural experiences in their family and their friends and their coworkers that they feel they need to have. And so they disqualify themselves out of fear. It's like, I don't know enough. I can't help. 
I don't know enough. I want to help. I don't know enough to not offend people. So I'll just leave that to the experts. And there's not enough experts to go around, like I said. And so the challenge then is to reduce that fear, not by saying, oh, you don't have, don't worry about offending other people. It doesn't matter. Oh, no, it matters. But you can do a lot more than you think you can do with the skills you already have. Many health professionals have certain skills that they use in service and mental health and education. And so a lot of those same skills can be applied to that those cultural competence goals. You can learn more as you go. But even if you may not feel like you're 100 in your cultural uh, awareness, you're probably not a zero either. And so to say, I'm going to do as much as I can where I'm at and then make an intentional effort, a personal commitment to learn more, to make the most of every opportunity I have to learn more as I go, that counts. That increases our competence, a moving goal, as opposed to a basic minimum. You grow and you put into practice and you grow some more and you put more into practice. And as you go, your clients benefit. You probably know more than you think you can know, you know, and you have skills that you probably don't think are even qualifiable, if I can use that word. But if we use that, and as a starting point, and then grow as we go, grow with every client we see, grow outside of clients, then you can be even better later. But too many people uh, feel like they can't start. They're, they're disqualified. I think that's a really good point. And I like what you're saying, which is we we learn and we grow, we learn and we grow and we keep building upon that to try to see competence as a moving target. So how do you approach this from what you call a shame-free perspective? Tell me what that means to you, because there is a lot of shame for people that want to be culturally competent, quote unquote, and are afraid of doing it wrong, afraid of causing more hurt. Well, in order to get past the shame, I, I get to a point where I acknowledge that shame is often more paralyzing than empowering. A lot of people take on shame as if they earned it, they deserved it. I have to say this, this is my fate. And again, it's, it's consistent with the disqualifying of oneself. Um, however, if more people are feeling that shame based on um, factors outside of their control, then it's not helpful to their clients. Uh, in contrast, I acknowledge that a lot of that shame is based on ignorance. And I, I use uh, ignorance in a, in a different way. Sometimes people use it as a negative attitude, some uh, downplaying, but I, I use it in the the sheer lack of knowledge uh, use of the word. And so we all have lack of knowledge about something. There's things that we know and things we don't. And so if we, if we acknowledge, yes, I grew up in a monocultural uh, family. Everybody in my family looked the same, came from the same background. Everybody in my neighborhood, everybody in my church, everybody in my city. It wasn't, I encountered many people uh, who say it wasn't until I went off to college that I have ever met someone from a different cultural background. And I was 18, 19, 20 years old when that was the case. And that's not uncommon. And so they say, well, obviously I can't do that. It's like, well, on one hand, there are things that you could benefit learning about other people. Sure. But that doesn't make you wrong and other people right. Just as much as you can learn about other people, there are some experiences that you've had that they can learn about. They don't know what it feels like to grow up in a small town and the impact that can have on the family and the pros and the cons and things like that. You need to learn about them. They need to learn about you. Whatever other you have, older needs to learn about younger, younger needs to learn about older. Rural needs to learn about urban, urban needs to learn about rural. And once you level the playing field and acknowledge that there's so many aspects of culture uh, that matter to different people and there's so many ways we can be different, it levels the playing field so that it's, it's a little bit less easy to uh, distinguish right or wrong. Those who are the teachers and those who are the learners, those who need to uh, to speak up and those who need to sit down and say nothing. It's like, wait a minute. Everybody can learn something. The challenge in that competence effort is learning what you know, acknowledge, accepting, owning it. I know this much and I don't know that much. But as soon as you identify what you don't know, the clock starts. What efforts are you making to learn? Not the clock starts as in there's a deadline, like how dare you? A lot of times people uh, fear, they either say it to themselves or fear other people saying it to you. How do you not know this by now? Everybody knows this. If you cared at all, if you're a reasonable person, you would know that. But that's not how knowledge works. That's not how culture works. We know what we know based on our, uh, our home experiences, our family experiences, our environment. And so how could you not know? Well, I can understand completely. You had no experiences that would have taught you that. The challenge is not how could you not know? The question is, now that you have opportunities to learn, what are you going to do about it? That's the challenge. To say I didn't know before doesn't offend me, Does, doesn't shock me. And I encourage you not to not to uh, paralyze anyone else as well. But to say once that light bulb happens, once you're exposed to different things, 
And that's when you decide whether you're going to incorporate it into your life in some way or whether you're going to dismiss it. And thus every client who has those experiences as a result and um, overcoming that, that fear barrier, that ignorance barrier. It's almost to the, to the point where I pretty much encourage people to accept their ignorance, not as a end point, but as a starting point. Accept the existence of it. It's going to happen. If we're shocked by our ignorance, if we are ashamed of our ignorance, then it's a period. It, then, then it stops us and disqualifies us. But, but if we accept the existence, we accept the reality of our ignorance and then make every intentional effort to reduce our ignorance more and more over time, making the most of every opportunity to do so, well, then we become that much more competent, that much more ready and prepared to help one more client at a time. I think that's a great point in the acceptance of the not knowing and that there's a lot of vulnerability in admitting when we don't know something, especially when we as clinicians have an automatic power dynamic with a client. So why don't we go there? Why don't we talk about this when you have um, generally white therapists that may be working with individuals that are from different cultural, ethnic, racial backgrounds? Um, What are some of the fundamentals that you see to help reduce the shame that white therapists may have of, of it's like, well, I want to ask, but then am I exploiting that person by asking? Sure. And how do I learn about this? Like, how do you see this? I think the the caution is definitely legitimate. Again, I say caution as opposed to paralyzing fear, uh, because that caution is still a moving forward. There's still, I want to move forward with intention, with you know, competence, basically. Uh, and so there's an acknowledgement that you have to see both the the legitimacy of your own feelings, your own cautions, your own experiences, as well as your clients at the same time. And so if you don't know, you have to acknowledge, accept your ignorance, just like we said, and then to say, in some way, I'm going to learn. But the question is, how do we put that into practice? If we, we can't go too far, we can't go zero. So we have to find that sweet spot in the middle. Zero is being afraid to ask and then letting what you say or do be reflective of your ignorance. And then you step on toes and you have to pick up the pieces later. Going too far is saying, you know what? You don't have to say anything. I know everything about people like you. I read about you in chapter six. It's like, ah, uh, I'm not quite sure what chapter and what book, but I'd appreciate it if you not assume you know stuff. Even if what you read was fine and accurate, that assumption that going so far as to say, I know more about you than you think I do, than you told me. It's about finding that sweet spot in the middle where you personalize it, where it's a little bit about learning outside of the session as well as inside the session. There's a balance between saying, you know what? I always wanted to learn about people like you. Uh, how about we just take the next hour and you just teach me your cultural background? That it sounds like a reasonable, genuine desire to learn, but it flipped the power dynamic when the person didn't pay to tutor their therapist. But there's also the other side to say, well, if I learn some outside of session, get some background, learn about a few different things, and then you lob it out there. It's my understanding that people from your cultural background uh, have been concerned about this or, or uh, have a certain value. Is, has that been close to your experience? Is that relevant to you in any way? You show you're not starting from zero, but you also show you're willing to allow them to personalize it and teach you about them. If you're right, then great. You you show you did some research. You know more than I thought you did, therapist. Great. Let, let's, let's build on from there. And if you're wrong, you still show the desire to understand. And they say, okay, you're not starting from scratch. That's pretty close. But let me personalize it this way and tell you about me. You still get the points for trying without putting an over overreaching burden on them to have to bring you up to speed or else they can get no help from you at all. And so if you don't go too far by burdening, and if you don't walk on eggshells, then they have to be they have to moderate what they say. They have to ration what they say because they have to worry about whether you can handle it. Don't go too little. Don't go too far. Find your sweet spot. And that sweet spot takes time to, to, to own yourself, to practice over time. But why can that be a great uh, sign of respect and care to your client to say, I see you trying, therapist. You know, that, that's pretty close. You're still the professional in the room. Well, one of the other things that, that trips people up uh, uh, for us helping professionals is the idea that I can't show ignorance. I can't show weakness. I can't show because then they'll think I'm, I'm useless. It's like, no, you can show that you know something. But when you have the confidence to know, to show, to express even that you don't know everything, then you build up more respect points. Oh, you don't think you know everything, professional therapist, but you show you know some things. I can respect that. And when I tell you about me, you modify, you incorporate that into your understanding. That shows you value my experience enough to let that be part of your understanding. 
thank you. So we don't have to be afraid of our ignorance inwardly or even externally if we do it from a place of confidence. Can you show value for the client seeing the differences? Not we're all the same because we're not. We're all different. Yes, but not to dismiss the differences, but to intentionally learn about them and to incorporate them into your work uh, with them and, and how you can personalize your efforts to their experiences. So many thoughts are coming up for me as you're talking about this. But as you said, you know, translating skills that a counselor already has to application in, in conversation about ethnicity, race and culture. I know I've had the experience of, for example, working with clients that have a very different religious background True. and having fundamental knowledge and then learning more. And then also do it's funny, as you said it, yeah. I'm like, that's exactly what I did because I'm not Mormon. <laughs> I don't know about the Mormon church. And I'm like, but I know that one of the norms about you know, women or about marriage or whatever. And it's like, is that what it's like? And so I hear what you're saying of the importance of taking that skill we already have and not being afraid to apply it over here where it's like, okay, I know some norms. I have a base knowledge. I know where to get information. And then I can ask, respectfully ask for for clarification. Um, Right now, we are recording this a little over a week after the announcement of Breonna Taylor's ruling. This is a time that is very charged for a lot of people across the world. And one thing I've seen from a lot of white therapists are saying on, you know, on social media, how do I talk to my clients of color about this? Am I being presumptuous when I try to ask about what's happening? And I'm assuming that they have this soft spot or pain here that may not be, and I don't want to assume. And right. then there's this default that I've also seen where it's like, well, then I'm not going to say anything and I'm going to yes. wait until they bring up the thing, even though I know about the thing. <laughs> How do you recommend that, well, I'll say less culturally diverse therapists talk about this and address this with their clients of color and with their white clients, not just with clients of color? I, I think the the caution is legitimate. Uh, the caution in the same way, that caution of, and I'm going to move. I'm going to say something. I'm going to do something. The question is how? So as opposed to paralyzing fear and overreaching, find that sweet spot in the middle. And my recommendation is always to try to find a way to initiate that doesn't assume too much. And by saying that, I try to lob. It's almost like a like a, a softball pitch, not, not the professional softball that will knock my head off, but that lobbing uh, elementary school softball pitch where you say, I don't know if you've heard about what's going on. A lot, a lot of things have been going around in the news. I was just curious if that it has impacted you in any way, uh, whether it be what we're talking about from last time, uh, picking up where we left off, or just in a new way. If so, feel free to, to share now. If not, pick up where we left off. And you just Im- you invite them to without stopping the progress of whatever you focus on and making it an issue, if it wasn't, and without trying to ignore the elephant in the room. And they are cautious sometimes. I don't know if I can bring that up. And if you don't overtly let them know it's a safe place to do so, I encourage people to find a way to let other people know it's safe to talk about that if you want to. But if you don't, I'm okay with that either way. And so it gives the opportunity um, for them to decide without them having to initiate. So that's that balance in between. And that all assumes you prepared yourself to talk about it in the first place. <laughs> we have to start off there. We have to say it's it's not that I mean the, the stakes are higher, but I mean just clinically speaking, we we have a certain treatment plan. We're focused on certain goals and meeting different things, and then Christmas comes up, and you expect people to say, "So how was your Christmas?" New Year's comes up. So how was your New Year's? It's a certain conversation starter. We interrupt our flow all the time for light things. This is just significantly more important uh and the ramifications either affect them or somebody in their family or somebody they know even on their job even if they don't feel directly impacted by it you can say well has it impacted anybody you work with has it made things more tense on the job you say well yeah i didn't really care but it has really made things more tense at work huh can you believe that and then that's an invitation for you to say actually i can believe that because some people are concerned about this you don't even have to make it their issue but your effort to help them understand what other people are concerned about and various different points of view. You don't have to take a side. You don't have to be for or against. You can just help them navigate their interactions with other people in a healthier way, which can help them either increase their own awareness and of the impact it may potentially have on them that they weren't aware of before, or you can help save them from 
having a, a, a save them from discord in a family com communication. You can save them a social media uh, uh, rant. You can save them getting fired for saying something on the job that was culturally insensitive by helping in a safe, the safe environment you create, explore it. And a uh, few sentences in, they say, oh, well, I never thought about it like that. You haven't changed their world. You just increase their awareness of the potential size to things and then say, well, do with it what you will. But you can help them, whether it be uh, uh, different uh, age ranges, different cultural groups, different political affiliations. You can still help people expand their perspective, their cultural awareness uh, without having to solve the world's problem. You said a lot of really meaty stuff right there. Uh, I'm going to go after one of the points you made about basically making sure that we're as therapists ready to to show up when we ask that question. So if we Indeed. say, you know, the news has really been focusing on this. Some people have some strong feelings. What feelings do you have about it? Yes. Being able to hold space for that. Um, I think many people can relate with the experience of the side eye of like, are you sure? Like, are you sure you want to open <laughs> Pandora's box right. about how I feel about that thing that happened? How can therapists create safety? This may sound interesting, but not just for the client, but for themselves, because I can see sure. a white therapist basically saying to a person of color, okay. I'm here. Talk to me about it. What feelings do you have? Yeah. And then like these really big feelings come out and the white therapist is like, oh no, like it's about me and they're not at me. And it's like, okay, hold Indeed. on. Like, now, uh-oh. How do therapists in any circumstance, not just relating to racial or ethnic or cultural differences, sure. but in any context, ground themselves to hold space for someone else's very big and different feelings that could splash over onto them? Yes, 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 yes. No, you said a lot there. And the, the, the direction is pretty clear. Not always easy. It takes practice. But with the with the intentional goal and direction, it can be repeated multiple times. Um, first, I always remind people to recognize what your role is. Your role is not to provide society solutions to everything. Your role is to help support people as they go through daily life trying to figure out what solutions they can be a part of and what efforts they can be uh, take any steps at, how much it impacts them. And so once you remind yourself of that, it takes a lot of the pressure off already. They're going to express something and the look in their eyes, the way they say it, they're going to say, I laid all that out for you. So what am I supposed to do, therapist? Solve the problem, remove the pain. That's what you're there for. And then you have to have just as much as you 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 do uh, for any other problem. Your goal isn't to solve all the problems, but to help support them in their effort to try to to, to solve it. Uh, second, it's the providing a safe place for them to wrestle with it. A lot of times they can't do that at home. They can't do that with a spouse. They can't do it with their family members. The dinner table is often a source of political conflict, religious conflict, cultural conflict. I can't bring things up or else it's going to tear our relationships apart. So you can be the safe place to say, the stakes aren't as high here because I don't have to live your life. You can say it here and it won't end our relationship. And you have to mean it. You, no matter what they say, they can't end your relationship because whatever they say, which is the third part, it's not about you. Whatever issues they brought in, they brought in, the, the experiences preceded you. And if it comes out aggressive, you can reflect that and say, wow, that's a lot. There must have been a lot of experiences that led into that, that fed into that, that made fed into fear or anger or caution or concern and misunderstanding and frustration. And you know, just because you know the experiences that you had, you didn't contribute to the vast majority of that. If there's something that was said or misunderstood earlier in your efforts, then obviously I say, you're not say 100%, but there is a situation that precedes you, which gives you the opportunity to empathize without having to defend yourself. Even if they say, well, people like you, it's like, yeah, you, you must have had a lot of frustrations with people like me in the back of your head saying, good thing I didn't add to that, one. And two, my actions right now are changing that trend because I'm not gonna defend and justify it. Well, you just need to understand. I can say, wow, that must be a lot to hold on to. And instead of their usual response of, of uh, re reacting to the minimizing uh, experience that they've had, they can look at you with a confused face and say, that's not what it, what people usually say when yeah. I say that. And and wait, you did hear what I say. And you heard how I said it. And you saw my face. You actually understand. You're validating my feelings. You're empathizing with my feelings, not the accuracy of the topics that I'm talking about, not the right or wrongness of them, but the feelings underneath. That's a skill we already have. 
we just don't often apply it to the deep stuff and say, even if I don't agree with you on what should happen politically or what should happen uh, in the court decision, even if we legitimately disagree, I can see how you're so frustrated by the outcome. I can see why you're so frustrated by the situation in the first place. I can see how you can fear what the implications will mean for your future. That makes sense. Even in the back of your head, I'm glad I don't have to worry about that as much as you. That can, that's a legitimate feeling that you can have. But what you focus on externally is, despite the fact that I don't have to feel, uh, feel that same thing, your feelings are legitimate. Your words are legitimate. How can I help you wrestle with option A and option B? Because at the end of the day, that's what we do. We help people wrestle with their feelings and then determine how they're going to act. And so you may be the person to help somebody wrestle with, I'm so frustrated by what happened in this court decision, this legal decision, this political decision, that I just got have to do something. And your first response could be, no, don't do that worst fear picture that came in my head. But professionally, you can say, so what type of f- things did you have in mind? First, let's understand your feelings and why you felt that way. Two, let's understand what the possible options are. Well, obviously, I have to do this. Well, maybe some people who feel what you feel do that. Other people who feel what you feel find ways to do it this way and this way. You can help throw out possibilities where they thought they only had messed up option A, and you can help them realize they had messed up option A plus some varying degrees of options B, C, and D. You don't have to solve the problem. Tell them what to do. Convince them to do what you would do. Just help them to explore their feelings and express it in whatever healthy looks like for them. That is all in the midst of cultural competence. But before we can do that, we have to have the professional confidence enough to say, this is their decision. This is their life. I'm just helping. I'm just listening, trying to help them understand and then hope for the best. I think the way that you frame this is really unique and and really valuable. One of the other questions I've seen come out a lot, particularly recently, is here we are as therapists sometimes experiencing the same traumas, maybe in a different way, but that our clients are. We may have talked in grad school about what happens if your clients are getting divorced and you're going through a divorce and it's like, yes. well, you're decision. Um, but we're in this really weird space right now, you know, grief related to the pandemic. We have a, a, a race revolution that's happening around us. Indeed. And all of these things have different layers for every single person. But I've seen so many therapists say, how do I not turn this into a talking session about a particular group of people or, you know, a a political party or whatever that is? Like how, if I, if I have aligned values with a client, how am I honest and authentic about that? Um, and establish safety without making the session about that. Does that make sense? Oh, it makes perfect sense. And my, my goal is often to come back to my, true therapeutic roots of uh, client-centered, person-centered, you know, empathy, genuineness, unconditional positive regard, and staying centered there. And in that empathy sense, I make it a personal challenge. I encourage anybody who's willing to do it to take the same challenge, to try to empathize with every client. Transcends treatment goals, diagnoses, uh, cultural barriers, whatever. If they have a general goal to empathize with every client, then on this kind of topic, then that goal makes itself really practical because you can make an intentional effort to empathize with multiple sides of the same controversy to say, even if we agree, let's make sure we're empathizing with the other side too, not vilifying them. I know we disagree with them on X, Y, and Z, but I can understand where they're coming from because they genuinely want that. Now we both know that there's a better way to do that, but they want this and that. So obviously (laughs) depending on how much you're trying to connect with your clients and join uh, you, uh, you can be a little bit more direct with that, but as a whole to try to help them, express understand their side better but also to be able to express it better so that when they're expressing it outside of your session they don't go over that hundred percent and say no not only do i have my side this is the only side the best side anybody who doesn't see that is not only uninformed they are the enemy because they want and it's like oh oh that's when it starts to scare me as opposed to i want to help uh the 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 the, the police officer and the victim. I want to help them. I want to, one, I want to make sure I'm trying to empathize with both. Wait, what, how, how could you, did, you saw what happened on the news, right? Didn't you see what happened? Yes. But I see the person behind the behavior and I'm c- considering as many possibilities about what happened before, during and after not to justify, but to understand the person and then the victim as well. What happened before, during and after so that I can help them understand each other. 
Because at the end of the day, it's not about justifying the actions, but how about how about improving and strengthening relationships moving forward? I think there's a lot of power in what you just said, because when you framed it that way, it became a conversation about systems. Yeah. And yeah. understanding how these systems are playing out and trying to avoid what Brene Brown calls side sorting, where it's us versus them. Exactly. And so often when we're talking about, say, a family, we have this sometimes the vilification of one, what I call monster member, where it's like, well, uh, th they're yeah. the reason that all the bad things happened. And exactly. so we, we trash that one person and blame it all on them. And often part of our work as systems-based therapists or counselors is to kind of expand that lens where it's like, well, yes. why might they have done that? And, exactly. and when they said that, why was that? And I can see the value in what you're saying. It's like, we have these skills. We just need to take them and apply them someplace else when we're looking at this from a systemic perspective and still holding space for the client experience yes and appreciating that it's different than we may feel in the same in same shoes exactly it, go, it goes back to um that that the skills that we already have that started from marriage counseling and you have two people who come and we're one we're one step away from getting divorced and he just doesn't understand me i just don't understand her and vice versa and you start to break it down and say tell me about some of these disagreements and let's reenact some of these arguments and, and misunderstandings and you get to get to the point where you say well when you said this if i can paraphrase if i can reframe what you're really trying to convey was this and that person says yeah that's the same thing but the other person says but you never said it like that that's what you meant that's not what i thought when you did that and when you can help clarify understanding then you can help people see that they're not they may even differ but not fundamentally they they want similar things but they're going about it in a different way and that same skill you can apply to law politics faith whenever i hear someone say i just can't understand how somebody doesn't see that fill in the blank that tells me more about your capacity to understand then whatever it is, you're going to fill in that blank because we need to be doing our best effort to try to understand. Even when I when I uh, do trainings for um, uh, faith leaders and clergy and, and they say, well, I just can't understand how people can't see that this faith is the best way. It's like, well, th then we need to start there. Can, can we start with under understanding that you got a head start? You grew up in a home and an environment that taught you one thing. And yes, eventually you owned it yourself and you believed it for yourself, but you had a head start. Can you wrap your head around the possibility that if someone else grew up in a different home, teaching different things, setting a certain foundation, how it might be reasonable that they might actually see the validity in another faith? Now, if they change that over time, that's between you and them. If you have different arguments, that's fine. But no, no healthy conversation can come until we can acknowledge that it's reasonable for other people to believe different things about a lot of different things instead of vilifying them and saying, no, my way is the right way. If you disagree, then you are the enemy. And so if we can understand multiple sides, then we as professionals can be prepared to support, not justify, not put a stamp of approval on, but to support every client, no matter what their position is, no matter what their beliefs are, no matter what differences we may have and say, well, I don't have to live your life, but how can you live your life in a better way than, than you did yesterday? And that can not only help us help them, but help them interact with everyone in their system and beyond more effectively. Absolutely. And I can also hear how then it kind of unlocks a clinician from responsibility. And there I think that's go. one of the things that, that I hear and that I think all of us wrestle with in various ways where it's like feeling responsible if a client makes a choice or does something and the importance of having that boundary where it's like we're yes. setting a tone to have a conversation and that we're not responsible for the outcome of that conversation. We're just responsible to set the frame and to allow it to have space. Yes, yes. Big distinction there. So one of the questions I've also seen come up a lot is like when you have um, a clinician and a client who have different ideological beliefs, particularly mm -hmm. relating to things like politics, many mental health professionals are very active in in different kinds of social justice. True. How can, in your eyes, how can therapists influence and have an impact in, in social justice in their community and still hold space if there are things that are being expressed that make you wince and maybe get nauseated. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm a fan of, um, of advocacy, both inside the therapy room as well as outside. Uh, there are people, there, there's professionals, mental health professionals who uh, are out there on the picket lines. They're out there in the protests. So whether it be for social justice stuff or even just outside of their uh, least favorite insurance company <laughs> trying to advocate for their clients and they're picketing outside. There, there's active 
um, advocacy in that way. And then there's also advocacy within the therapy room. A lot of times people, whether it be for ideological reasons or just they feel like they're an introvert. That's just not me. I'm just not one of those out there kind of people. Uh, that doesn't disqualify you from advocacy, by the way, because advocacy is pretty much uh, bro broken down, uh, slimmed down, uh, doing your best to speak out for your clients, to help people, to help your clients outside of the therapy room. When you have the pleasure, the honor of being a therapist to a teacher, helping them not only increase their um, effectiveness, their functionality, but helping broaden their perspective to the experiences of others. You are advocating for every student that person teaches. You are planting seeds that can help somebody not get kicked out of class based on a cultural misunderstanding because you planted seeds that help them understand different experiences. Every uh, uh, police officer who you have the pleasure of counseling, even for their marriage, their own personal experiences. And then this kind of thing comes up and say, well, can you believe what you heard on the news? And you can expand their empathy for other people. You are helping every person they encounter on the street from there on in, every politician, every business leader, every faith leader. It's, it expands beyond that. And so as we try to empathize with everyone and we help other people do the same, not as an agenda, not to put our, our side on there, uh, then you are helping uh, make fertile ground their ears to hearing different things and then helping them more healthily express it to other people, which means it's, it's the same way where you, you, where you can uh, do family counsel with only one person, you know, the whole ideological kind of thing. You, you, you change one person, it changes their impact in the family, and then the patterns change. To what? <laughs> to be determined. But you can still advocate in various different ways. If you're active, great. If not, so be it. But that same reality comes up. What if you vehemently disagree with the person sitting across from you? you? You will be showing your growth to empathize with that side. And then when you express, you know, some other people uh, wrestle with this or believe that uh, and you bring out two or three different things and you slide yours in to one of those two or three different things. You don't have to have the pressure of making sure they believe what you believe. You just open them up to seeing the potential validity in a variety of different perspectives. They they came in with one. You came in with one. By the end of the uh, end of the session, you've explored the validity of four. And now neither one of you have to be as antagonistic them towards you, and hopefully you toward them. Because even if they say, "I see where you're coming from," I still kind of lean toward this for these particular reasons. You can say, "I can see how that you feel so strongly about that, based on your experiences, based on your values." inwardly you say to yourself i don't but i can see where you come from and if we can do that we have that distinction it's okay to be different and at the end of the day even outside of cultural differences and things like that there are going to be many times in your career where a client will make decisions that you don't agree with that you won't put a stamp of approval on this isn't the first time and yet we find a way to say hey that's you we don't we don't uh, look at them and as they walk out look you do what you want to do don't don't come complaining to me if it goes wrong we don't do that we support our clients we allow them to be them, pros and cons, all, all there. Why not do the same thing when it comes to the, to the more significant things as well? And to say, huh, I can use that same skill of showing non-patronizing support of them. I look forward to hearing how that goes. I see your pros and cons. I don't have to really focus on whether I would give you the same grade, but if that's the best option you see available, then you go ahead and do you. And I look forward to talking about that when you get back. And it can change the playing field, create a safe environment for them and for you. There's so much here. There's so many questions <laughs> I have for you, Lambers. You Love really it. zoom out in this perspective. And what you just said about, you know, a therapist having very different beliefs from a client potentially and things that are very, um, that are hurtful, and maybe inflammatory yeah. for that therapist. Yeah. You know, speaking as a woman, I've absolutely worked with clients that have belief systems that are damaging and hateful toward women and right, having right. to wrestle with that yeah. because my heart turns sideways, you know, it's yeah. just like, Oh, okay. Like this is not just outside the room. This is not something that happened. Like this just became kind of personal yes. and then having to hold space for that. That's a big ask. Sure. sure. How do you recommend that clinicians um, work through that being able to hold space for these differences of opinion that are really, really significant right now, yeah. you know, that are, that are in the streets, that are in the polls, because I think it feels really um, vulnerable for yes. people that are, are very clearly on one side or the other. And I think just a quick side note, I think you bring mm -hmm. a really 
important zoomed out perspective that when we talk about any kind of cultural diversity, it cannot simply be white and black. It has to oh, be yeah. also the striations within, well, this is what this, what white looks like in this part of the country, in this right. particular subculture, and Indeed. recognizing the existence of that as part of the spectrum, I think is a really important point. Exactly. Um, so, but back to my original <laughs> question, um, how, how do therapists prepare themselves to hold space when the wind feels really big and it feels like they could get toppled over. Yes, yes. When when the, when the stakes seem high, especially and the stakes seem personal, it can be a little bit harder. Um, when you bring up the example you, you brought up, yes, uh, culture uh, has more than just to do with uh, race and ethnicity, more than just black and white, but definitely uh, different uh, race, ethnicity, age, uh, gender, socioeconomic status, faith, beliefs, political beliefs. All of those are various aspects of culture. That's why I can say we all have similarities and differences, not just we all have different shades of a certain color. They all have different things that we identify with as core to who we are. And so there's a challenge of not saying, oh, more to memorize. No, more things to consider. It's like a great puzzle piece. Huh, I, wish, I wonder which one of these puzzle pieces will have the most impact right now. It's, it's an endless opportunity to understand other people. But what if those things directly impact your ability to hear and understand. I say, I want to empathize, but how, how right. do I empathize with this? Did you just hear what he just said? And one of my, one of my best secrets, I always fall back to, it's not a secret, it's just one of my go-to things when things get particularly hard, is to remind myself that there's some reason why they believe what they believe. And that is legitimate for them. It's not accurate or inaccurate. It's legitimate for them. They had some experience that taught them this. And the question is, what opportunities can there be to modify that to be more healthy? Somebody says they had, uh, they they just say some really chauvinistic things against women. It's like instead of, be, uh, well, after being initially offended, <laughs> I guess instead of uh, our feelings are legitimate. After that, tell myself what experiences with women did you have that taught you? that horrible belief. That's what I say in my head. I'm not gonna say horrible belief. I like, uh, what experience did you have? Because it gives legitimacy. You had a legitimate experience that taught you something illegitimate. It's almost like uh, the same uh, logic I have with stereotypes. You know, that that, that common phrase, uh, even a broke clock is right twice a day. It's like they saw the clock the certain time twice a day and, and believed that's the way it is. So I can't deny their experiences. That, that never happens. And they'll think in their head, no, I've seen it happen. So if we go and focus on what experience, well, all men are bad. What experiences have you had with men? All people from this cultural background obviously believe that. You had a negative experience that didn't work out. One, let me sit, take the time to understand the experience that led to that. Then I can expand, not only remind myself through your talking, that experience wasn't with me, anybody I know, anybody I care about. You are not saying that offensive thing if I'm no, if I'm the therapist being offended. You are not literally trying to offend me. You are trying, you're sharing the reluctant reality that happened to include me. But if I understand why you believe it, then I can then mold that and say, I see that experience. I value that experience. But do you realize there's other times in the day? There are other experiences around that clock. That is a legitimate experience. It's not a wrong experience. It's a legitimate experience, one of many. And if you open your mind to the many, then you don't have to delete your history, delete your experience. You can just realize, oh, that was a unique scenario. I didn't even think about the fact that there could have been other experiences. I didn't even think about my first three girlfriends. Count them, three. All right, can you believe it? Client will say, uh, were this personality. Thus, all women are. Well, what about this woman and this woman? And what about this? And it's like, oh, well, and we can do the same thing uh, without confronting that, without uh, dismissing their reality. And by doing that, it gets further and further away from our personal experiences. And then we can acknowledge, oh, they are ignorant. Again, not in a negative, low um, knowledge, uh, not, not low uh, maturity kind of way. So it's like, oh, you're just letting me know about your limited experiences. <laughs> Thank you for making this a little bit easier for me. I have the opportunity to expand your awareness, to reduce your ignorance. One example that came up, one of my first experiences challenging my own practice of this very thing was a client I had years ago and he came in, uh, he knew my faith background, and um, but he came in a professional context and said, hey, I heard about you and uh, you, you're one of those people who have faith, but you don't shove it down people's throat. I haven't had any experiences of that. And it's like, sorry to hear that, <laughs> um, but okay, great. But what do you need help with? It's like, I wanted to know if you could help me wrestle with something. Every time I, I ask this question, I like lose friends and 
um, and, and sometimes even family members, but I genuinely want to know. Perfect setup, by the way. You just let me know. You genuinely want to know. That makes it perfect. Set up. It's like, I'm, I'm, but I'm really curious now. What's the question? And he looked at me, and uh, he's, a, he's a, a male, uh, older, white, um, trying to, you have many demographic things so you can picture it. He can, and he said, well, I just want somebody to explain to me what was so wrong about slavery. And in my head, atomic bomb went off. And I'm like, I'm sorry, what did you just say? <laughs> and, and you just had the nerve to say that to my face? <laughs> and But at the point, he set it up so well. Genuine curiosity, genuine trying to understand. I'm African-American. He's saying it to me with no clear intent to offend. And it, it just, it just it was a shakeup from all of my expectations or preparations. Like, my inclination was less to get offended. It was a knee-jerk reaction, of course. But then right after that was a curiosity. It's like, tell me more. And it's like, well... What is it that you don't understand? I try to say it as much, with as much calm on my face as opposed to reaction. He was like, well, I, okay, I get it. It, it. it was bad in the sense that people were taken and uh, a lot of people died and, and a lot of things, bad things happened. So, and in my head, I'm like, okay, where where's the confusion then? And then he, he skipped forward and said, well, but in the end, it all worked out, right? You're a lot better off now than if you were over there. You're not in huts and, and you're in the economy now and a lot more opportunities here. So, in the end, doesn't the end make it, you know, okay? I mean, it doesn't make it all good, but why are you still mad about it? And it changed the whole conversation for me. Did it make it okay? Did it make it right? Did it, it was, is that something I'm going to recommend he just say at McDonald's tomorrow or, or in the, over Thanksgiving dinner? Not a chance. But in this, he, he considered this a safe environment to ask a question, to genuinely understand. How can I pass up on the opportunity to say you're in a safe environment and you genuinely want to understand Despite our cultural differences, despite the implications of that having to me historically, is there an opportunity to put a dent in this, to change that conversation? And I don't have time to go through the, the long uh, answer for it, but I basically got a chance to say, I can understand where you're coming from. Validate, validate. I can see your genuine understanding. Based on looking at it now at the end of the story, you're trying to understand. So just some things to consider are, yes, things may be different from a modern uh, perspective and different opportunities, but can you understand how it can be devastating and traumatic to not be able to trace your history back only to a certain amount of generations, to have so many opportunities taken away from you, to have lineage and messages and, and customs passed down that were just taken away, to have what came after literal slavery and the demoralizing, dehumanizing impacts and the impact that that had on self-esteem, on self-worth, moving all the way down. And I said this in the most straightforward kind of way, the most empathetic way. It wasn't just what happened for a certain amount of years and then it stopped. The implications kept going and different people respond to that different ways. And there can be a, a lot of, if that never happened, I wonder where people would be right now. Can you, and, and a little bit by little bit, one sentence at a time. This wasn't a history lesson. This wasn't a 16-week class. This was just in, acknowledging there's a lot more to your question than you let on. You just have, every time you ask that question, it was about get over it. All everybody heard was get over it. It wasn't that big of a deal. But if I expanded his language, a lot of conversations can happen after that. But it wouldn't have happened if I would have just been offended that the question itself automatically meant you closeted racist. If I offended the, 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 the question itself says you don't care about other people and you're trying to push it away. Maybe it did. Maybe it meant that. Or maybe he had a genuine desire to understand and nobody took the time to open his mind to different possibilities. After that, he can then start to learn more things. Now I know more things that I didn't know about and I want to. But if all he gets is offense and reactions to legitimate feelings, oftentimes when other people respond to that, they're saying whenever anybody asks a question like that, it's followed by negative actions toward me. It's followed by mis uh, mi uh, minimizing and dismissing. It's and I can't let that happen. I can't let what you said go unchecked because I have to protect myself from the future. But if you reassure people, I'm not who you fear I am. I want to understand. I and I'm not starting from scratch. I understand some things. And I, any, anything, if you if you lay a foundation like that, anything you say that is accidentally offensive, no, that's where uh, the different conversation, the broader conversation of microaggressions comes in, those unintentional offenses. You're genuinely trying to say something um, uh, considerate, but you unintentionally offend. If you set up a foundation of authenticity, of trying to understand, you will confuse someone. And they might say to themselves, normally when people say what you just said, I know to write them off. Normally, when people say what you just said, that means this is what's going to follow. You're going to say this is going to follow that. But you set a foundation of actually trying to understand me. This is technically out of character. Maybe you don't mean what I think you mean when you say it. It doesn't make it OK. It doesn't make me like it, but it does make me give you some grace room. And then I can follow up and then 
maybe on let me maybe later on i say well you remember that time when you said this <laughs> yeah yeah i probably wouldn't say that again if i were you i mean look you're lucky you set up a nice foundation because not because it was bad or you're bad because sometimes people might misunderstand your intentions like me a while ago uh, but i took the time to help you understand you sometimes we don't have to fear our offenses because if we set up a foundation of genuine understanding seeing value and positivity and showing that up front we can give ourselves that grace room to learn as we go reassuring people that we're trying and even when we make mistakes we are actively owning our mistakes owning our ignorance and learning as we go it changes the whole playing field maintains a safe environment and then the clients say huh you're not perfect but you're working harder than a lot of other people i know and not even in a negative way not even in a, a groveling subservient I, I know i don't know everything but if you're just willing to give me a chance then maybe that changes the the authority in the room you don't have to go that way but just acknowledge i know some things i don't and if there's something that offends you i want you to notice a safe place uh but if not then i'm gonna try to see as many of them as i can before you even have to say it uh and it's like okay let's see what you got and it and it changes opportunity and then that gives us opportunity to learn more about different cultural backgrounds practice our skills and how we say certain things increase our self-awareness other awareness we can learn there's so many things when we, we can learn as we go uh but i definitely encourage people to acknowledge that they're not starting from zero and then to intentionally increase their effectiveness by increasing their cultural competence as you talk about this i can hear almost this anthropological approach to it, where it's this importance of curiosity instead of assumptions about how things should be. But if I check my assumption at the door and allow myself clinically to have this reaction of like, oh my goodness, that was offensive. <laughs> um, and then trying to back up and appreciate it with curiosity. Yeah. That story that you told, my goodness. <laughs> I mean, I, I can't imagine what that was like for you and also there's an incredibly high compliment in there hmm. which is your establishment of safety for uh, a client to bring that into the room when they've been yeah. shut down so many times outside yes. in the real world and how incredibly therapeutic not yes. easy but right incredibly now. therapeutic it is for you to have laid the foundation for him to have a corrective experience, exactly. to be able to address this thing that's been on his mind, in his heart, and do so safely. Exactly. The the challenge I find there is a lot of times if we're if we stay, I don't I don't knock uh, the feelings of offense. They're there for a reason. If you had a negative experience, then the fear of another future negative experience coming is enough to be offended. So that's completely legitimate. However. If we stay in that place of offense and just end the relationship there, then we've done nothing to reduce the likelihood of repeated offenses in the future. As opposed to some people have to come along. If it's not you in the time, then own it. If it's too hot, if somebody else said, you know what, I would have just been too emotionally reactive in a moment, I couldn't have, then own that too as a temporary state. Don't stay there because at some point, some people as helpful professionals have to come along and say, I can try to help understand you, validate the genuineness behind your intent, as well as the unhelpfulness of some of the ways you're going about doing it and help you find a way not only to increase your understanding, but these are some strategies you might want to employ if you ex expect to have that conversation with anybody outside of this safe environment. See, the way you've been going about it was this way and this way. That makes sense based on your understanding. But because I can uh, increase your, uh, your awareness of other people's reactions, why they might respond to you this way, you can go into that next conversation a little bit differently than you did before this session. You are not only increasing their awareness, but you are equipping them with how they can function better outside of your, your safe environment, relationally speaking. And if we don't take the time to do that, then we're just going to be perpetuating the same cycles. They're going to say something offensive or fear saying some offensive, say nothing at all, and no one's helped. No one has reduced anything. We just all go back to that sensitivity issue of walking on eggshells. And then at that point, I view it like a minefield. We can yeah. either say, it's it, there's so many minds in there, I'm too scared, I don't wanna touch it. Or we can learn strategies to navigate the minefield. Oh, that's a little hump over there. I think that's a sign of a mind. Oh, that one is, is a little bit exposed. I can see certain things. I, there's a roadmap. I learn some things as we go. And if we're learning those things on our own and helping other people learn, you know, I found that if I say things this way, it often gets underneath those things. And I give that to my client. I'm helping them reduce offenses and then hopefully repair relationships afterwards because all hope isn't lost. Even if you do offend somebody, you can only say, wait a minute. Was something you said, was, was something I said offensive? Obviously, 
oh, well, it, it wasn't obvious to me. Now, if the conversation ends there, then we, we haven't gone, well, you should know my intent and my intent should be good enough. Intent does not take away offensive feelings. But if you own it and you say, I see that, my bad, I apologize, not in a subservient, I'm not, I'm not worthy sense, but your feelings matter to me. Thank you for letting me know. If I can take a few minutes to try to understand what was offensive about it, reassure you that wasn't my intent. But more importantly, because I have a better understanding of what that means to you, in the future, you can expect different behavior from me. Now, other times this is kind of confusing because sometimes people can say, wait, no, no, <laughs> you can't be offended because somebody from your cultural background told me this is what they prefer to be called. This is what they prefer, I say. And it's like, thank you for letting me know what they prefer to be called. When it comes to me, I prefer if you not call me that. And it's the continual navigation. We can be frustrated all we want that it should be universal, but not many things in life are universal at all. Uh, terms of reference, cultural preferences, as much as to say, hey, outside of the right or wrong, what's more important? Us arguing about uh, the right terms or, or phrases or, or, or values or me understanding you, how, how you want to be seen, understood and, and valued. And then keeping getting getting back right back on track with the with the helping efforts that you're there to do in the first place. If we stay focused on the person behind the difference, then a lot of that becomes a lot less difficult than it was before. Other things to learn, sure, it's it's a skill to learn, but over time it goes right back to what we said at the very beginning. It's going to be a little bit easier for you next year than it was this year. It's going to be a little bit easier for you five years down the road than it was now if you work on it a little bit by little bit, one client at a time, one opportunity at a time. Not making it your priority but keeping it as one of your priorities, one of your considerations when relevant and looking for it to be relevant. And then as opposed to not doing anything about it, you can either be better to what degree you won't look like anybody else, but you can be better five years from now, a year from now even, or you can keep it under a rug and be in the exact same place of fear and caution and not going into that minefield. Um, and um, that won't help you or your clients. And so, uh, although reasonably intended, uh, reasonably trying not to offend. I like the intent. It just makes me sad that you won't be as helpful as I believe that we all can be uh, because you have skills that clients need. You have validation and understanding that clients need are longing for. You can help them wrestle with difficult decisions in life and you have the ability to help but disqualify yourself sometimes and the clients don't get the help. And um, that's what we need to actively uh, change so we can all help as many people as possible. I think there's so much power in what you just said and the value of that corrective experience and a, a repair either in the moment or after. I mean, I've had the experience oh, yeah. as a clinician that when, you know, a session ends and then I think about it and I go, yeah, you know, that that was a time I should have said something or that my my facial expression, I don't know if the client took that the right way, the way I meant it, yeah. you know, like, and I want to clarify and then coming back to that, which is scary because we are, we want to be like the expert and we want to do everything right. We don't want to be vulnerable, but <laughs> the immense power of circling back with a client, even down the road and saying, this thing has been on my mind. I yes. think there's just so much healing in that and the humanity of what you were able to offer to this client is just enormous. Um, Lambers, I could keep talking with you for some time <laughs> on this topic. Um, how can people get in touch with you? What resources do you recommend for people who are listening to this going either, I want to hear more from Lambers or <laughs> how do I in general increase my cultural competence? Uh, well, as far as increasing our cultural competence as a whole, um, I don't have a, a master list, but I do uh, recommend people try to make the most of every opportunity they have. Uh, I'm very much a fan of making the most of uh, every book, every movie, every documentary, whatever you can find. There's a degree of discretion uh, you have to have of knowing that everything in a movie isn't 100 percent accurate. It's depiction, it's representations. But sometimes that's the only way you can expose yourself to experiences that you've never personally had before. And even as you encounter that, you can watch and say, huh, I wonder how much of this is an exact representation? How much of this is just fictionalized? Because I, odds are it's not 100% and it's not zero. But anything more than zero is enough for you to learn. I can train your staff, which allows me to bring not only valuable content like this, uh, 
light bulbs over people's heads, but also help people wrestle with the particular issues that they're dealing with in their environment, what therapists are wrestling with, maybe different than what teachers are wrestling with, maybe different than what pastors are wrestling with in different environments. Uh, they can go to my website at diversity made simple. Uh, dot com, which is actually the point I've been talking about. Diversity made simple, demystifying it, de scarifying it, uh, and then say make it more empowering. So my goal is to make diversity simple. And so uh, I not only have my my online course there, but also point to different resources as they come up, different um, uh, type of messages that I do on my email list to just try to encourage people. So I say, hey. Your clients can benefit from you keeping on trying. And so if they uh, have the interest, they can look, look me up on that. There's a contact page on my, on my website as well. Uh, my, my email is on there as well, lambers at lambersfisher.com. So I'm easily findable. There's only one Lambers. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, and uh, I look forward to hearing and helping in any way that I can. Thank you, Lambers. This has been a really illuminating and centering hour. Thank you for spending this time with me and for sharing your insight with our listeners. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. You've just finished listening to another exclusive continuing ed podcast by Clearly Clinical. If you like what you just heard and you need continuing ed credits, please visit us at clearlyclinical.com to check out our one-year membership, where you'll have access to our growing library of continuing ed podcast courses. Clearly Clinical, where our goal is to help you learn, grow, and shine.